Hello and welcome to the Stansberry Investor Hour. I'm Dan Ferris. I'm the editor of Extreme Value and the Ferris Report, both published by Stansberry Research. And I'm Corey McLaughlin, editor of the Stansberry Daily Digest. Today we interview Harry Krishnan, money manager and author of The Second Leg Down. And today, Corey and I will talk about 2023 and 2024, things we learned this year, things we're bullish on and bearish on for next year. And remember, if you want to ask us a question or tell us what's on your mind, email us at feedback at investorhour.com. That and more right now on the Stansberry Investor Hour. Well, here it is, friend, our last sort of freestyle rant of 2023 and what a year it's been um i think we learned i feel like we learned a lot this year but i'm not sure exactly what it is (laughs) i feel like i learned a lot but i'm not sure what it is a lot happened i mean we we i I started out the year thinking well this is going to be the second year of a bear market and that kind of didn't happen at all really i mean we had some bearish action here and there but it was really nothing right i mean it is and it isn't right only just recently did the dow jones industrial average uh make a new all-time high uh the rest of them still as we're speaking right now haven't um they're pretty close now all of a sudden uh and then you would say hey that bear market is uh kaput for good but yeah i mean this is or a lot of other people would say this bear market is is done for good. But yeah, I guess what 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 I learned this year that the most heavily forecasted recession of uh of all time could, <laughs> could that all those people would be wrong and the market will still go up despite all these obvious kind of concerns that are still now heading into 2024 the same concerns. I think and a little bit more the when you look at the consumer debt levels and corporate debt and those sort of things heading into to next year with a Fed that appears to be saying rate cuts are coming before anything else. So it's usually when the bad news starts to uh, turn to bad news, I think. Yeah, that's, um, that's what I'm sort of leaving 2023 with is this feeling of something doesn't add up at all here. And I know I've been accused of being kind of too bearish, perma bearish, whatever, even though that's, I can demonstrate that that is absolutely false (laughs) and have many times. But it's weird to me that um, the markets are kind of on fire and, you know, 100 basis points have been lopped off the 30 year mortgage and, and, you know, other, other interest rates have really, have, have fallen quite a bit. Um, And the stock market is on fire all of a sudden. New highs in the Dow, new highs in actually S and P five hundred total return, but in the same way, like like interest rate cuts against low unemployment and bullish stock market action and optimism and stuff, like interest rate cuts would not be good. <laughs> that that would be something that you would do if you were afraid of interest rates. You know, the cost of money hurting the economy. If you were a central banker, you you take you take interest rates down when you think uh, you know things are slowing up and the economy needs a boost and you know um, you you don't you do it when you want to stimulate in in a word and why would you want to stimulate with stocks making new all time highs and everything else looking pretty decent I, I don't I don't get it. There's a, there's a disconnect between expectations of rate cuts on the one hand and everything on fire on the other. Yeah, to that point too. I don't know if you saw this, but you know we're talking a couple of days after the the, the Fed, latest Fed meeting with Jerome Powell, where I, the market shot up as it, the that announcement came out, and of a pause and projections for three rate cuts in next year, and. Now we have the the Fed underlings, the other people uh, on the Fed coming out in the media this week and saying, like, pump the brakes on that. Like, they're they're trying to do like a little, uh, I don't know, you know, we'll call it damage control or message clarification. Uh, you had Aaron Goolsby today yeah. saying he's confused by the market reaction and it doesn't make sense to him. And like, yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, but that's that's what the market was was thinking. So I, I don't know. But it's um, right. Yeah. Yeah. John Williams, the New York Fed president, who's probably the number two guy there, right? Saying we aren't really talking about rate cuts right now. That's what he said on Friday on CNBC. I so right. I don't know. I, either they're trying to dampen the mood, or just really aren't talking about rate cuts, which I don't believe since. They literally wrote down in their projections that they, <clears throat> excuse me, that they are talking about rate cuts. So <laughs> I was just going to say that. Doesn't it say <laughs> something like, you know, penciling in sort of, sort of penciling in, in the summary of economic projections, like I think three cuts in 2024. <laughs> so, you know, those zany fed guys, you never know what they really mean when they're right. talking. And at, and at the same uh, time, you got which, oil prices, you know, down 20% you know, from their last ties, like our, our guests will talk about a little bit, like, mm -hmm. which is confusing, mm -hmm. which would indicate, um, you know, some expectation for, for, a, of a slowdown. So yeah, it is a, there are, right. Yeah. However, I'm glad you mentioned that because our friend Jason Gefford over at Sentiment Trader put out a piece recently, the gist of which was a 25% drawdown in oil prices is not necessarily a reason to sell or hasn't been one historically, you know, that's their thing. They crunch historical data like nobody else. And, uh, and historically speaking, they said, you know, uh, 25% drawdown. I mean, it's a volatile commodity, right? Commodities are volatile. So 25% drawdown in oil doesn't necessarily mean that the oil price is going to continue falling or stay low or whatever. And I don't know, in general, right now, like 70 plus dollars a barrel like the big guys are minting money at 70 plus a barrel. They're minting cash and they still are up against this, you know, green political thing that discourages the long-term investments they need to make um, in order to generate new supply. So they're going to be paying dividends and buying back stock as they have been amidst falling capital expenditures. So I continue to believe they're actually a pretty good bet, even though they have to some extent followed the price of oil around. Um, yeah, you got the U.S. government too right, buying yeah, I, at these prices too to to uh, <laughs> fill back up right. the the, yeah. the the oil reserve. So yeah. got that right. going for them too. All right. So I wonder if we could, um, I don't know, I, if I could sum up what I learned in 2023. It would probably the the learnings in the market tend to be just an affirmation of timeless wisdom. You know, nobody knows if there's going to be a recession. Don't even bother trying to predict it. Um, you know, don't predict short-term market direction. You don't know where it's going in the coming year. Even if you're Dan Ferris and you think you know it's going to be the second year of, of a bear market, et cetera, et cetera, you don't know. So it's just the usual stuff that one one year usually teaches you that one year doesn't mean shit. <laughs> yes, correct. Because I will say one other thing as you're, that, I, that I maybe am reminded of is you know, stocks that go down 20%, 30% in a given period, 40, 50, like these tech stocks did in 2022. Mm -hmm. Like typically, if you have a long, longer time horizon than, than that, like that is the time when you should be, if you're interested, should be thinking about buying shares, not, not unloading them at that point. And anyway, if we've seen the, the returns from these tech stocks, you could say what you want about the valuations now, but you know, last year when Netflix and Meta were down 40, 50 percent, nobody wanted to touch them. And that would have been the time to that would have been the, the time to do it. Yeah. So that's always a reminder, too. And I'm reminded of yeah. that now with like a stock like I keep looking at Hershey is still down 30 percent and now trading like sideways. Yeah. Like that's not going to uh, that right now is the time to kind of think about those things. And whenever you see a company that you like has a mm -hmm. massive drawdown like that, like it's time to put the cash to work then more than any other time. Yeah. Right. If you still like the business, like, why aren't you buying? Yep. Period. We've talked about Disney in this respect yep. too. So yeah, let's, maybe we'll look ahead um, to 2024 a little bit. Is there anything like, um, and, and we got a nice piece of feedback from a listener that says, stop talking about the Fed so much. So maybe we'll stop. I don't know. If, I don't know if we'll stop 100 percent, but we'll we'll try to keep it to a minimum. And is there anything that you're like really bullish on for 2024? Maybe what we're really bullish, really bearish. Let's do the bullish first. 
um, I have a couple of them right off the top of my head. Is there anything that you like looking ahead? Do you think, wow, this is a really good buy right now? Uh, you know, bullish right now, you know, cause I am concerned about, uh, recession slash slowdown sometime in early 2024. I really am. So right. if anything, I would be bullish on kind of conservative approach to things at this point. And T bills are just if you're if you're waiting to pounce on stuff, T bills short the shortest of short term, the one month ones are still paying five point five percent. So if you're concerned about something in the next month, two, three, four months, just I'm bullish on that and rolling those over until <laughs> proven otherwise. And yeah, just exactly what I just said, you know, looking for things that are down 20, 30 percent and knowing that in the longer run, th those prices will will be higher. And if we're going to see something like even like if we end up seeing like some sort of like deflation that surprises the heck out of buddy, heck out of everybody, you're going to be happy to have cash because that's you know, by definition, it should be more valuable. So um, I am bullish on T-bills which is probably the least sexy thing I could say right, right. now, but that is the truth. All right. Um, you know, T-bills, like, I agree with you about T-bills. Um, you know, you're not going to get any movement on the on your principal right. there. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's just going to stay steady, and and your yield might even fall. But I agree, at 5.5%, I'm gobbling it up, man. I love it. I would say housing is one thing because if we do – you know, rates are down a little, you know, somewhat. Um, actually, it's a lot. If you look at the bank rate, sort of national 30-year um, mortgage rate, it was 8%. Now it's 7%. That's, that, you know, 1% over the life of the loan is substantial. So that's really good. Plus, on top of that, the big home builders are buying them down to, you know, 4 and 5%. You know, definitely the 5%-ish neighborhood. So I have to continue to be bullish on housing. If we really do get a rate cut, I mean, that first one, your housing stocks are going to pop 5% uh, because it's like, well, wow, yeah, this is great. And then the spreads are going to go, you know, close up even more. So that's one thing I'm definitely, I continue. Like we got a, we got a bit of a head fake, like a bearish head fake in housing this year. But, um, you know, the stocks all came roaring back and and now rates are down, so. And those buy downs are coming through there. It, it's not like the oil companies we just mentioned, because these guys can put the money to work, right? People aren't selling their existing homes because they've got 3% mortgages. And so home builders are filling in the demand with by building. So they can build, they can put the money to work. Um, and, you know, they can make plenty of money doing what they're doing. So, you know, maybe their margins will suffer from the mortgage buy downs but they'll keep making money and i think that trade is going to continue to do well into next year cool very good one other thing i'll say i'm yeah. i'm bullish on since i you know t-bills might not scratch uh scratch scratch the itch for too many people <laughs> um right bitcoin i am bullish on bitcoin hmm. because we're approaching one of these bitcoin halvings next year which traditionally throughout the the brief short history of Bitcoin has been a catalyst for much higher prices and new highs eventually. It might not be in 2024, but it may be in early 2025 based on history and timing these, these things out. Um, you're already seeing, I mean, we've seen 150% gain in Bitcoin in the past year, right? You may think, well, all right, it's not, that's 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 overbought but it's it's not if you look at this you know the i'll get a little in the weeds of the stock to flow model which i'm sure you've seen which if you believe that bitcoin is a hard currency um mm -hmm. this model has been dead on on the path of the price for since the beginning really and um you know for the limited supply and then when these halvings happen, the, the increase in demand, the, the, just the whole balance, and there's just different charts you can find out about it. I am, I am more bullish than ever uh, on on Bitcoin because I think at this point we've seen 
you've seen we've seen these these crises, right? We saw SBF, FTX. Um, you got the SEC going after cryptos. This is all in the past year, and yet it's still there. It it has not gone mm-hmm. to zero, and so you know all those things behind. If you're gonna get a new wave of people interested in Bitcoin, which you might in a economic downturn or a recession, you know, from a, a new generation of people. I think that whole story can start all over. The Bitcoin story can start all over again, especially if you're seeing prices go, you know, if you see something like over 100,000 or something, that's going to get a lot of people's attention. So, which may create more FOMO and push it all higher and, yep. and on and on. So, um, I'm not saying like put your, your whole, you know, net worth in there, but um, I am bullish on Bitcoin for the next year or two. Yeah. I, I'm not sure how I feel about Bitcoin <laughs> anymore, honestly. Um, I, I I started out. Um, I was really skeptical. I was like, "This is this can't." You know, I saw the price action, and I was like, "This thing is going to fall ninety percent." And actually, after I said that, it fell eighty percent. So you know, I was close. Right. Um, but then I then I recommended the thing in in the Extreme Value newsletter because I thought um, I thought it was real. I thought this is this is actually going to work. You know, this is reasonably well designed and, and I think it, um, people will use it. I thought, I thought people would actually use it, but the more time goes on, it just, it trades like such a volatile, crazy, you know, tech long type of a thing. Um, but you know, by the time a guy like me says, Oh, okay, this can function in the way it was in originally intended. Um, you know, it'll be a million dollars, right? <laughs> you know, it'll be a million dollars and then it'll just go sideways at a million dollars for a decade or something. And then I'll be like, oh, okay, it works. <laughs> it's good. You know, and everybody who was, who started getting bullish when you're getting bullish would, would have said, you know, Corey's a genius, Dan's an idiot. <laughs> and that's the way it is on Bitcoin. Yeah, no, um, I, I see that. I, I, right. Yeah. I no, I still think it's like speculation, right? Like you said, the way, the way it um the way it trades i would not be surprised at all if it goes down 40 50 percent soon either like but i i think like longer right. term i i think it's it's clearly established itself as if nothing else a speculative asset class that is there you might have the first mm-hmm. etf coming on soon uh bitcoin etf there's other ways to get exposure to it in public markets but not a not a spot right. etf so that may be um, a catalyst that you know a lot of people have been talking about that i you know i'm not sure it's like an inflation hedge like gold is it it hasn't behaved like that yet um and you're right like nobody's how many people are exchanging bitcoin for for things like i, I don't know not like you know you're not buying mcdonald's cheeseburgers with bitcoin at this point you're 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 still using cash and credit cards and even when you buy something, you're going from cash to Bitcoin, probably back to cash, right? Because yeah, and the the banking system is still is increasingly getting control over the on ramps and the off ramps to to crypto. And so, you know, to me, I'm looking at more of as like a speculative asset than any real sort of, uh, you know, more so than the the real use case for it. And that's been the story with Bitcoin too for since the beginning and it still hasn't changed. So makes sense. Okay. So we got housing and Bitcoin. Yeah. Right. I got Bitcoin and T bills. So I'm playing both, both ends of the, yeah. Yeah. You're running a barbell strategy. Um, so I think in addition to housing, you know, I'm, I just continue to be a long-term energy bull. So, you know, uranium, um, and oil and gas. I mean, the world the world runs on this stuff, and I think uranium will be like people will talk about uranium more and more and more. They'll talk about small modular reactors more and more, and they'll build more and more of them all over the world. Um, and I think the the incentivization price is probably around um, you know sixty bucks. So. When uranium's at 60 bucks, though, that doesn't mean that investment comes screaming out of the woodwork into uranium. I think um, I've spoken about copper in this way. I think it'll, you know, it probably takes 50 or 100 percent higher than the than the 
incentivization price than the price at which people start making money, right? It'll it won't take sixty. It'll take a hundred dollar uranium or a hundred and twenty dollar uranium to really get money to start moving. A lots of capital start moving in and beefing up the supply. So, I think it's got you know lots of legs under it, and um, I think it'll continue to do well for the next few years, however long it takes for the uranium price to get up there in triple digit land, which I, I think it probably will go at some point. Um, <clears throat> and as far as oil and gas, you know, I, I talked about it earlier and, and that's it. You know, as long as oil and gas companies are disincentivized to make the long-term investments they need to generate more supply they're just they're going to keep minting money here at 70 or 73 bucks a barrel as we speak and they're going to buy back shares and pay dividends and that's it yeah and i'm bullish on companies that are buying back and paying dividends too throughout all these downturns you know that we've seen and fake outs and bear market rallies mm-hmm. i mean if you just held on through those times and got rewarded along the way you're probably pretty happy when mm-hmm. when you get a, a 15% spike in the uh S and P five hundred the last couple oh, was like two months you know so you're and that price yeah. is higher generally you're like oh all right I'm glad I uh, glad I got more shares and and dividends while I was while I was just sitting there so yeah yeah I agree I got one more for you mortgage backed securities they've already done well you know they've they've moved along with the whole bond market here but um, I think you know it'll be It'll continue to perform as long as we're, um, you know, interest rates are higher, right? So you want to own them more. Um, And if we really do see, um, if we really do see lower rates, if the Fed starts cutting rates, well, guess what? These things are guaranteed. Um, Yeah, they've got really good assets behind them, et cetera. They're great securities. So they'll perform really well. They, I think they've got plenty of convexity built into them, which means you know, um, a little move in in rate, a little move over here means a big move in mortgage-backed securities, a bigger move in mortgage mortgage-backed securities. So I think MBS will do well. I'm personally holding them. I think they're great, and um, so that's another one. You know, it's and it's part of the whole housing idea. And and just the simple fa- and it actually relates to your your T bill idea too because we're talking about a safer bond that is generating a decent yield now and will continue doing that as long as you hold it, um, but with more convexity in it, with more kind of upside potential than that T bill mm-hmm. that you have. So that is really really kind of attractive. To yeah, me. yeah, no, I can see that. Yeah, T bills, you're not going to get any capital you know appreciation or anything like that so right which yeah. is good that's or the way it's designed you know um, <laughs> so, but yeah, uh, yeah. right yeah. exactly <laughs> that's that's right okay so bearish for 2024 i've got one but i'll i'll let you go first because i think we might have the same one uh, <laughs> all right bearish uh what am i bearish on you know i'm not necessarily bearish on stocks still given all of this um Given the concerns, mm-hmm. I you know I, if we get a recession, yes, there will be, um, there should be uh, a, a cut for stocks. But like I was just saying, like if you're holding mm-hmm. the right ones and that are going to reward you along the way, and you have a longer horizon, not necessarily a problem. I don't think. I mean, if you're if you're one mm-hmm. or two years and don't want to lose anything, you know, can't stand to lose anything, that's a different story. Um, and I'm I'm on the longer end. I'm not in the one or two year end. So, personally, um, okay. Yeah. So my my bearish call is actually magnificent seven. Oh right. Yeah. I think if we really do get, you know, if if this market action right now follows through into 2024, and we get you know another maybe even like a melt up or whatever, and people respond to and the Fed cuts and people respond to the lower rates the way everyone is sort of the way the market is discounting right now. Um, I think money flies out of those, you know, magnificent seven and into probably 
garbagier small caps and stuff because the small caps really ripped better and bigger than anything in the wake of this Fed news. So um, I think that, and I think the the Magnificent Seven was a good trade, you know, for late 2022 into 2023, but I think it's long on the tooth. I think they're expensive. They're great businesses. They'll gush cash. They'll pay dividends or whatever they do, buyback stock. But I think the move is, was, is big and they're, they're kind of expensive now. Agreed. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you on that one. So you were right about that. I, I, I uh, yeah, I'm not running out trying to buy Tesla right now. So it's, um, yeah, there's other things to do. And yeah, you're you're right. On the small caps, have been ripping higher off this Fed news, which reminds me, like, yeah. okay, it, if it's really the end of the bear market, small caps usually lead the way mm-hmm. out and up, you know. And so maybe that's mm-hmm. what we're starting to see. And it may not yeah. happen still for months or however long, but I think that you you definitely saw small caps leading the way off this idea of Fed rate cuts. Small caps went from like the Russell, if you, if we're calling the Russell two thousand small yeah. caps, small caps went from like fifty two week low to fifty two week high in like a couple of weeks. It was like October 20 something, 23rd, I think, to just, you know, a few days ago. Yeah. Just like, wham. I mean, that's a breathtaking move. Um, and again, I, I mentioned our, our friends at Sentiment Trader. They pointed out this, you know, it doesn't happen that often, but it has happened before. And, and um, you know, it's a bullish thing. It's been bullish. Yeah. So if that signal, if you guys are right and, you know, you just mentioned it and they mentioned it, you know, that that could be the one that's telling you, yup, this thing's for real. There's a there's been a change. 2024 is going to be a ripper. <laughs> Get long and strong. And and away we go. Would be nice. Get past get past 2023. 2023 yep. was a confusing, puzzling year in, in some ways in the markets, I would say, as I, I guess maybe yep. all of them are. <laughs> But but this one this one yeah they're all this puzzling one definitely years. qualifies. Yeah, one year time frames are puzzlers <laughs> because they're yeah. unpredictable. All right. Well, okay. Um let's turn to our guest today. And we talked with him recently, and I would I'm thrilled to have him on the show. I'm thrilled to have Hari Krishnan on the show because he just has a different way of looking at things. And he's had an interesting career. I follow him on Twitter. I always want to know what he has to say. And we're going to talk about his book, The Second Leg Down, which is an interesting title, isn't it? And I really want you to take notes on this one. He's a sophisticated guy, but he tends to be able to explain things pretty well. And I'm I'm thrilled for you to have the opportunity. If You've probably never heard of him before, but uh, you're about to learn a lot, I think. And, and I will too. So let's do it. Let's talk with Hari Krishnan. Let's do it right now. The Fed wants you to believe they've got inflation under control, but I believe we've only seen the beginning of a devastating new crisis. And if you don't prepare now, you could see your savings evaporate as inflation and interest rates soar even higher over the next two years. It all traces back to a golden thread that ties together the biggest financial calamities in America's history. But it seems the entire financial world is falling into this very same denial trap that led to massive devastation the last time this crisis played out. If you know your history, you know there will be winners and losers, and now is when you decide which one you'll be. I've spelled it all out in an urgent new report. Go to www.bankrun2023.com to get your free copy. I'll also show you how to get my complete playbook for navigating this crisis, including the three critical steps to take immediately. Again, that's www.bankrun2023.com for your free copy of my new report. Hari, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Dan. So I have my uh, trusty compatriot, Corey McLaughlin, with me today, and we will be... uh, Hitting you with lots of good questions. Hopefully they'll be good, and and I'm sure, I'm sure they'll be good answers. Yes. <laughs> well, that's the question, but we'll see. 
So you're new to our audience, and I'd like our listeners to sort of be a little familiar with you, what you've done and what you're doing now. And who is this guy? Who is this Hari Krishnan? Well, I should shave my head. I've told this joke before. Move to Denmark and become a, a <laughs> faith healer or a yeah. rishi, or at least a, tea, a commercial guy <laughs> in that vein. But um, no, uh, I've been a hedge fund manager for many years, covering a lot of different areas. I was an FX manager for many years in the UK. I've run numerous long volatility slash hedging mandates over the years. I'm even in the commodities space at this time in a fairly big way. But um, my core business for the past five or six years has typically been providing hedging strategies for uh, various clients, institutional and high net worth. So I've been around the block. And I do have a quant background, but I'll try not to um, go too far in that direction because I may never return. <laughs> so uh, that's pretty much my background. All right. Sounds good. So, Hari, the one idea that I want to start with um, is something that I found very interesting because it just speaks straight to the way people really most want to behave. Their, their short volatility right? They're, they're long. Most of the time they've got their stocks and bonds in their 401ks. And then mm -hmm. when do they think about hedging or worrying about downturns? Is it before the downturn? No, it's after it. It's after that first leg down. And I found, I was so intrigued when I found your book, which is titled mm -hmm. the second leg down strategies for profiting after a market sell-off. Just for that reason alone, because I thought, well, isn't this exactly what people want to hear? Um, and yet, you know, I would have thought, well, that's, you know, it's too late. But according to you, yeah, yeah. Not, after that first leg down, not necessarily too late. Um, even in terms of like pricing for, for some strategies, like you, I, I was impressed by what I found in the book. Hey, thanks. Well, let me give you a little story there. A lot of what I do, even though I do dig go into the weeds quite a bit. Everything I do, I try to base on what I see from clients. So I'm trying to address what clients, real clients are worried about. And it's only natural that, you know, if you sit back and look at valuations or you look at the credit markets, there are times that are great for buying credit and there are times that aren't so good. And the best times are after a bit of a sell-off when uh, spreads widen and you get more return per unit of risk taken assuming that the bottom doesn't fall out in the world. Volatility should be the same thing. It, it ha does have a fairly discernible cycle. It's not precise, but fairly discernible. And there are times when volatility is very cheap. But it's cheap precisely because nobody wants to buy it. Nobody wants to buy protection. And I could go out, and I did, used to go out and say, look, I can go out and buy a two-year to maturity put that protects you against a move greater than 10% down in the S&P, and you'll only pay 15% vol for that, which is pretty low. But nobody cared because they said, well, there are a bunch of good reasons why stocks will continue to go up. And I never really got that many mandates except from fairly forward-looking people during bull markets. But then as soon as things went bad, you know, so you take something very severe like March 2020 or 2008, early to mid-2008, and so on. Everyone wants to hedge. And it's precisely because everyone wants to hedge that the cost of hedging becomes expensive. So what I wanted to do was to come up with a suite of strategies, a range, a toolbox of strategies, as it were, uh, that would allow clients to have hedges on no matter how bad the situation got, but where the nature of the hedging would change over time. So the whole book is really, the second leg down is really about regime-based hedging. And the theory that I had was, and it's borne out in a lot of analysis, is that you know there's no option strategy that is universally bad. And there's no option strategy that's universally good. Um, each strategy is sort of fits into the every dog has its day category, where there are hedges that are efficient that you can put on no matter how bad market conditions get, they might not protect you all the way down and you may have to be more dynamic. But the beauty of that approach 
is that if you have different hedges that you can put on as conditions get worse, as there's a second leg down, as fear increases, you automatically have profit taking built in because you're rotating from one type of hedge into another. And I know I'm sort of rushing through this a little bit, but the, my basic point is that for a lot of hedgers in quiet markets, they can hedge and it, timing doesn't matter too much because the cost of insurance is low, but they don't know how to take the hedge off. And having a strategy where you have different types of hedges that you put on as market fear levels go up can be very effective, not only in terms of efficiency, but also in terms of profit taking. Okay. So this all already, this sounds like very sophisticated, you know, swapping in and out of option strategies, depending on, you know, what, where you are in a market decline. Sure. Um, What I wonder is, and I wondered this, like, I didn't like read every word of your book because frankly, I look at some of it and I go, "Mm, you know, too many, too many equations in that sentence there or whatever. Yeah. Um, I was told that, that my sales would go down by 50% for every equation I put in. I couldn't (laughs) help myself, but there you go. Well, I bought it and I still don't know the equation. So, I mean, maybe that's not a hundred percent true. Um, (laughs) at any rate, what I wonder is the, let's say, you know, the average guy who might have a, what would to him be a substantial six figure sum, usually in stocks and bonds, uh, is that, you know, what, without like having to get a PhD in math, I wonder if there's any simpler way to do what you're suggesting. In other words, when they're down that first leg, is it a simple matter of, uh, you know, it, it, actually, I'll leave it there. When the average investor is sort of down that first leg, they don't have your knowledge and experience. Short of having you manage their money, is there anything they could do or do they simply have to suffer through the drawdowns? Yeah, that's a great question. And I'll try and break it down a little bit, which is that um, you never want to have too large a position on than you feel comfortable having. So... There are various ways to play it. If if you were very long stocks, let's say tech, and tech goes into a 10% drawdown, you have a few choices. One is to sell your position down a bit, but then try and reown it by buying call options. So if I if I own the NASDAQ in size, the NASDAQ's down 10, 20%, I might feel like it could go down 50%. My perception of risk will have changed. But if I go and I sell some of the position and rebuy the position with bounded risk using call options, that's one way to play it. Another way to play it is to uh, have solid risk management, have some rules for at increasing and taking down positions as conditions change. I know that in the equity world, life is a bit different from other asset classes in the sense that when an index gets cheaper, it's usually considered to be to offer better value, which kind of flies in the face of a lot of the strategies that I apply in markets outside of equities. But, you know, there's some level at which you can only take so much pain and you have to get out so that you can at least focus on other things. I mean, one of the big topics in the book is what sort of strategies can you apply that allow you to take a walk around the block? maybe with your dog, I I don't know, but where you don't have to be glued to the screen, watching every tick, not knowing what you're going to do with the next tick. You know, in other words, let's say you're long in size, the big seven in in the NASDAQ, and um, you've lost 10%, 15%, you have a sizable portfolio, and the market trades up a little bit. What do you do? Do you just breathe a sigh of relief and continue staring at the screen? Or do you do something about it? And what if the market ticks down a little bit? Do you panic and sell the position? Uh, Or do you just watch the ticks again, hoping it will go back up? Having a plan for the average investor is very important. Even if it doesn't maximize alpha in the short term, it allows for good decisions in the long term. Because you can work on your research instead of being fixated on watching the screen and um, losing your mind in the process. So I think having a plan is very, very important. 
you actually are reminding me of another guest that we had on the show, Annie Duke. And she talked about. All right. Yeah. Yeah. She talked about making decisions and the mistake of resulting. Meaning that you could think you've done something awful because your portfolio is down however much percent, but maybe you haven't done anything awful at all. <laughs> and the right thing to do is nothing because you've actually made a very good long-term decision. You know, and of course, it works the other way as well. You haven't necessarily made a great decision just because your portfolio is up over a given time. It's hard to know all that, though, isn't it? It's hard. Actually, I'm reminded of, you know what I'm, else I'm reminded of? There's a quote sure. from Cliff Asnes in the book. And, oh, yeah, there is. Yeah, you know, yeah. yeah he's talking about, um, you know, he's like, I can't tell you how impossibly difficult it is. I, I forget the exact words, but the gist of it was, I, I don't have the words to tell you how difficult it is to ride through a drawdown, basically. Even though you know that this drawdown is normal, you're on strategy, you know, everything's working out as it ought to, you know, according to history and, and what you expected the strategy to do, it still doesn't matter. And so that's, amp that's multiplied by folks in your business, right? Because you have clients beating on you every day, but it's no less difficult. In fact, it, it may even be more yeah. difficult for just the average individual investor who is our listener and our reader to stick to their strategy without a Cliff Asnes calling them up and saying it's going to be okay, uh, you know, or a Hari Krishna yeah. calling them up. <laughs> Well, there are a couple of things uh, on that point. The first thing is that um, I once heard a uh, musician say that, uh, a jazz musician say that I'm practicing today for things that will naturally or spontaneously appear in my playing in six months, right? And that's what you're doing research for. And you need the time to do research so that your learning does evolve over time. So I don't want to give client or the, uh, listeners the view that your strategy, once you decide it, is etched in stone and it will never change. You do need to be dynamic, but I think you need to be dynamic over longer timescales than just trying to um, come up with an, a moment of brilliance in the middle of a, a volatile market. That's where I say you need to stick to your strategy. Um, that's point number one. Point number two is I, I, Jerome Abernathy told me this, and I, a well-known uh, managed futures guy. And um, I put it in the book. I should have given him more credit. But uh, he said something like, uh, it looks good at 60. It looks great at 50. It looks absolutely fantastic at 40. And you're out of business at 30. So that kind of mindset is very important to have because you will have opportunities in other markets. I mean, I used to know an investment club. My wife was in it. And um, they basically had the view, and they were all retail. They had the view that, um, well, if we have a winning stock, uh, we'll sell it because we can monetize that. But if we have a stock that's really dropped, we won't sell it because it's going to come back. It's eventually going to come back. And there, there are two problems with that. One is that you've just thrown risk management out the window. But perhaps another problem is that even if you lose money on that one trade, if you find a better opportunity to redeploy the capital, I would argue that ignoring tax consequences and so, and so on, that that's the right way to think about investing. You don't think about tabulating every individual trade and saying, oh, that was a winner or a loser, but you search for opportunities at scale and see if you can find them and take the cash that you have available and deploy it. Uh, rather than saying, oh, uh, I've got this position on and uh, it's eating me up inside. I'm losing money every day. And what am I supposed to do about it? Uh, think about what else you could do. Think about whether you can diversify into something else that may have some convexity, some upside potential that your current position doesn't have. Instead of thinking of, oh, this is like my um, family. I cannot sell this position. It's very different. You, you've got positions on and you need to be willing to look for new opportunities over time. And that's something I would recommend to clients as well. Don't get stuck in one paradigm manage your risk as though you have a system, use a system, but also look out for opportunities where you can build upside into your portfolio. And as somebody who looks at volatility a lot, that's what I think about. Can I come up with trades? You don't need to use options, but I do. 
that I can sort of put in my cupboard and not think about unless something really rips. And then I'll, I'll look and see how it did, and then I can do something with it. So I almost have a different perception of these lottery-style trades that I sprinkle into my portfolios or into client portfolios uh, than I do about the rest of the portfolio. And I think that's another thing that uh, your investment crowd can think about. Are there ways to sprinkle in a few highly convex bets? Doesn't mean you need to use options, but you find stuff that's really depressed and may have big upside. Put that in. Don't follow that to the same degree that you follow the core portfolio and see what happens. Um, I think that's another takeaway that clients can get without going in, into the t- technical issues too much. Actually, in, in your book, you did have one example that I found very simple, very easy to understand of something that is pretty complex, um, where you talked about the, the return that you get from, you know, if you get plus 1%, plus 1%, plus 1%, plus 1%, plus 1%, then minus 5 and then reverse it and say minus one, minus one, minus one, minus one, then minus five. Yes. And everybody wants the constant plus ones. Nobody wants sure. the constant minus ones. And yet, as you pointed out, that's the one with the better return. I was fascinated by it. I've never heard anyone explain it that way. It's very simple. Well, uh, Mark Spitznagel wrote a whole book about that, basically. Yeah. <laughs> uh, about compounding risk, you know, mm-hmm. how... Um, I th- and also Nassim Taleb said some stuff about this, how if you took out the worst 10 single days in the S&P, the annualized return would go up substantially. And uh, this is all true, and it's all about compounding. You know, if you, if you lose 50%, it's going to be hard to get back in, in the game. Mm-hmm. So you need mechanisms in place, and this is why clients call me up. Uh, they don't want to lose more than a certain amount. They feel that if they lose more than 20% at the portfolio level, let's say, Mm-hmm. they're in a pickle because they're not going to make it back very easily. So they need something that's going to at least maybe not put a hard floor on their losses, but cushion the blow substantially. And that's a big part of my job. I have seen, and I know I sympathize with many clients who look at volatility and look at ETFs and see all the ETFs decaying like crazy, you know, whether it's the VXX or whatever. And they think, well, there's no way to hedge. But this is not true. There are ways to hedge effectively based on the state of the world at a given point in time. And uh, we can go into that too, if you're interested. I I am interested in that, Harry. That was um, one of the questions I had jotted down here to maybe ask you was, how do you assess the risks out? How do you personally, you know, assess risks out there in the market within whatever you're allocating to is say somebody's allocating to a specific uh trade or idea or something do you assess like geopolitical risks do you assess value i mean you're assessing valuations are you just these yeah. are all th- these are all great questions and i try and divide my brain if i can into the guy in the engineering room and the macro guy the guy in the engineering room writes a book like the second leg down or market tremors he's basically saying perhaps, can I take a a bunch of 50-50 bets and make money off them by structuring the trade? Or can I add convexity to a trade or reduce the bleed in a trade that has a negative carry where I have to pay to keep the trade on? Um, And and do, do things like that where the engineering function is basically designed to take a view and turn it into something that can be held for a long period of time and provides plenty of upside capture should things go in the direction of the view. That's one side of my brain. I don't mean left or right, but just some piece. Um, The other question is, um, how do I formulate views? Well, that's a more complex question because I do partner with people for that. But um, I'll give you some examples of things I look at. I tend to be very cross-asset class focused. So right now I'm a bit puzzled because uh, commodities, many commodities are depressed now. Uh, Wheat, corn, copper is not very high, natural gas, you can go down the line. And they should be indicative of recession. And yet 
equity multiples are very high. And it's true that rates have come down. The 10-year has rallied hard in price terms, stuff that I do look at. Uh, but you know, last year, the move out was far wider. And now we have kind of a symmetric 2022 and 2023, which surprises me. I would have thought we would be down in those two years, given the change in the macro landscape, what the commodity markets are signaling and so on. So if you had to pin me down, uh, even though I use a lot of external research for this, I would argue that the best way to look at macro, from the if you don't have time to really dig into great detail, is to look at consistency across different asset classes. So commodities, are they cheap relative to equities? Or uh, rates, if you look at the change in rates, how would you explain the discount? Or the, the equity risk premium, given the higher the jump in rates, and so on and so forth. If you find inconsistencies, that's where the trades tend to evolve or tend to uh, emerge from uh, at the macro level. So I'm very macro focused. If you said to me, well, what do I think of NVIDIA or something? I wouldn't be able to tell you because that's not really what I do. I view everything from the top down lens. So, um, and I also look a lot at risk. You know, what's the market pricing of risk? And a lot of people have done this work. I've also done some of it. And uh, it basically shows the really weird stuff that happens in markets where, uh, so take equities, because I'm sure your clients, uh, your audience is more familiar with that. So equity volatility is low, let's say. Okay. So what does that mean? It means that institutions have the freedom to allocate more to equities. Not only because their risk systems tell them that they can, but also because they've been making money in equities so they can add to their positions, especially if they use margin. So what happens then? Uh, the market rallies. Other people have FOMO, so they want to get in as well. Uh, Little dips are bought because people think that buying dips is always going to be good. The market continues to rally. Volatility compresses. Uh, the VIX, not that it's the be all and end all, goes down. Uh, that allows even more risk taking. It allows uh, funds that allocate on a volatility adjusted basis to stocks, bonds, commodities, and so on uh, to increase their equity positions. And so the cycle keeps feeding itself. And the flows go into the indices, so the biggest names get the biggest pop based on the impact of all that buying, that uh, sort of valuation and sensitive buying. And the cycle continues until it just breaks, it snaps. At some point, there is a shock that is large enough that it forces the latecomers out of the market and the snowball starts rolling down the hill. So we're seeing very different dynamics from what we used to see in the sense that I think Rallies are harder than they used to be because the leverage cycle winds pretty quickly nowadays on the upside. And sell-offs are also um, can be very severe and come out of nowhere. And I think that's something that investors really should be thinking about, the fact that rallies are quicker and also sell-offs can be very rapid and unexpected simply because of the way the spring coils and then explodes to the other side so uh, or pops out to the other side right so let's maybe talk about that relative to this moment we're here we sit in uh call it mid-december of the year 2023 and um mm -hmm. i guess it was about october i think it was 18th or 19th since then we've had a pretty substantial move up um and as we speak we're um you know, a day after um, the Fed has done its thing and and markets were in love with it and rallied very hard. Uh, and of oh, course, the victory lap. Yeah, the Fed victory yes, lap. The Fed victory lap, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, after a year of really, really huge outperformance of the Magnificent Seven, if I had, I mean, is are, are you looking at this and, and sort of <laughs> anticipating um, you know, like you said, the, the rallies are hard. This has been a real, you know, screamer, especially the last few days. Um, and especially in like, you know, you can point to certain pockets like small caps and things, just really yeah. head full of steam. Are you anticipating, are you already anticipating the decline or 
How do you look at this moment? Yeah, there are lots of things to say. Well, the the market was selling off. By market, I mean the S&P. So I'll just mm-hmm. focus on the headline until I think October the 27th. And it's rallied 15% since then up to the time of this call. Uh, volatility has fallen off a cliff. It's gone down by 50% nearly. And we're in a situation where volatility in many, many asset classes is extremely low. I mentioned copper, natural gas, corn, wheat, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, So you have depressed commodities with low vol. You have equities with extremely low vol at the index level. And yet interest rates still have relatively high volatility. The 10-year note is trading at a reasonably high volatility, which should be suggestive of uncertainty in the system. Now, can I time when the market's going to sell off? Probably not. And the second book that I wrote, which uh, I should plug just for my own sake, uh, Market Tremors, basically says that it's a bit like earthquake detection. You cannot really say when the earthquake will occur, but you can see that there are fault lines building up that are causes for instability. Um, I'm not a uh, sell side research guy who's going to say my price target for the S&P for 2024 is X. I won't even hazard a guess. But what I will say is that complacency levels are extremely high at this point. And if you have been in the market, uh, I would think it's a great time to think about hedges. If you have participated this year, especially in, in tech, I think it's a great time to think about hedges. Now, if you view the hedges as a line item where they bleed a bit every month and you try and get rid of them because you, they're not doing as well as the other stuff, then hedging probably isn't for you. But if you think of it as one package where you can keep that that uh, sort of valuation insensitive trade on mm-hmm. and cover the downside, I think it's a great package, a great combo. And now you don't need to be that sophisticated, in my view, to start hedging. If you didn't hedge this year, more power to you. Now is a great time to Think about hedging even over longer horizons instead of selling your position. Why give up more upside? It's possible that things could continue rallying from here for a few months. So I think now you don't need to be super sophisticated to hedge your equity risk. Just go in and buy index protection and uh, you can carry your positions for longer. So we'll stick with the S&P 500 then. Um, You mentioned earlier when we were talking, uh, having at one point bought, what, a two-year two-year protection, two-year put for a 10% decline in the S&P 500. I, I don't remember if you were talking purely hypothetically or if you had done that. But Oh, I've been doing that for years. That stuff okay, years. you've been doing that for years. All right, there you go. So if you're not of a, if, if you're not Hari and you're, you know, you're not doing this for years and years and it's new to you, maybe this would be a time to learn about that. Well, I'll give you, I'll give a couple of little keys to hedging. One of them is, where do people like to hedge? What, what do they like to hedge? What strikes and where? Um, mm-hmm. Think of it like this, and I, I think I talked about this in the first book. Let's say that the three of us worked for the same firm. We're long-only managers, but we have the freedom to hedge a bit. We sit around a, a table, maybe in London, maybe in New York, wherever, and uh, we sort of say, well, how much do you think the S&P could go down in the next six months? And you might say 15%, I might say 20 and and so on. Uh, and then what we do is maybe we average that. We say, well, maybe the market could go down 15% in the next six months. That's the scenario we want to protect against. So we go out and we buy 5 to 10% out of the money puts with three to four months maturity on the assumption that we don't just want to hit the strike, we need to go through the strike to start making money on the hedge. So we sit, we sit and agree on that. And so that's where the liquidity is. And that typically is the area where protection is overpriced. So what I've found, and I've done a ton of analysis on this, is that three to six month puts on the S&P that are somewhat out of the money tend to be expensive. Now, some of the big uh, institutions who will remain nameless trade spreads big spreads through the market, and you can track what they do. Uh, 
I think the goal in tracking what they do isn't to do the same thing by any means. It's to avoid buying the strikes that they have bought or to anticipate what they will have to buy and buy it before them. I'm not suggesting this is a uh, thing that you should do to try and uh, honorably front run these big institutions. I think a better strategy is just to avoid hedging in the places where they're over hedging simply because they're price insensitive rules-based hedgers. And that brings me to the next question. Well, where else can you hedge? Well, shorter dated stuff is attractive because even if markets are really selling off, uh, there's this thing called Vega, which is the sensitivity of an option to fear or to volatility. The Vega is pretty low, so you can go in there and even if the market's selling off and there's a panic, you can buy a one-week option pretty cheaply uh, in price terms, uh, at least. Also, the long dated stuff tends to be laid off by many people because it's a little bit less liquid. But if you're not a huge investor, you can easily work limit orders in the in the market. But also because people don't really understand how these options will respond to sell-offs. They're more volatility sensitive and less price sensitive directly. But now is a great time to be buying some of that stuff because fear levels are extremely low. Now, to be fair, when there's no fear in the short term, there tends to be relatively more fear in the long term. It's like any commodities market. If there's abundant supply for a commodity today, the futures curve will be in contango, which means that forward prices will be higher than prices today, simply because there's some risk premium or their carry costs, whatever. Um, but still, the price levels out one year, two years are extremely attractive. So again, if you're a, someone who wants to hold on to your winners and ride them as far as you can, I, another quote from the book, it takes courage to be a pig, which is Stan Drucken, Stanley Druckenmiller's quote, uh, be a pig, but have some risk management down below. Um, that's fine. And so those are some things you can do. Buy long data protection and forget about it. Keep your position on. Maybe trim your position if you don't want to hedge or look into the shorter dated stuff. I would not look into the zero day, one day to expiration things that a lot of retail uh, clients have been seduced into looking at post GameStop and so on, simply because these are very hard things to trade. They take a ton of attention and they become increasingly rich. So just giving you a couple of numbers, uh, as of today at lunchtime, which was uh, the 14th of December, uh, the 15th of December straddle, which means kind of the implied volatility uh, for at the money options in the 15th was about 17, and it dropped all the way down to 9.9 .9 going out uh, two weeks. So there's almost twice as much risk baked into the one day move as the two week move. Now, to some degree, that's valid because one day moves tend to have fatter tails, but this has become overdone in my view. And I don't find great value in trying to be a hero over one day horizons. Not unless you have a seatbelt on your, on your desk, on your chair that prevents you from leaving the desk. And so you can monetize profits as they come in. Um, <laughs> so I would discourage that in general. I was known for this. I was apparent. Some people sent me stuff on Twitter saying, oh, you're the guy who loves the zero day to expiration option. Can we offer hourly options? And I, <laughs> I, admire, I thanked them for thinking of me, <laughs> but I, I, hadn't, I hadn't really proposed that. I, I, just did, I basically took some analysis that others had done in an area called econophysics, which basically says, how does the distribution change as the horizon increases? So are there more outsized moves relative to a normal move over one hour horizons, one day horizons, one week, and so on. And I did find that short-term horizons had the fattest tails. But now the whole market knows that, or enough people in the market know that, so mm. it's become very rich to trade that stuff. So uh, I would do one week or out, perhaps, or very longer dated stuff, or mm -hmm. at the very least avoid the whale or behemoth trades that that you can see go through based on the largest etfs right and you can probably see that just you know a guy with a regular account could see that just by you know looking at the options pricing and and seeing the incredible amounts of volume in those areas you're talking about the three to six 
Yeah, you'll um, see a lot of open yeah. interest, and yeah. then you have to guess which side the open interest is on. <laughs> and this is a big project I've worked on for commodities. But for equities, it's pretty basic because everyone and their cousin is long the world equity markets. It's not like commodities where right. producers are trying to go short to, to uh, lock in profits. And there are other players and users who are trying to go long to uh, get some upside if the price runs against them to control their margins. In the equity markets, it's pretty clear. There's some buy rights. People do sell calls for income. There's a lot of put buying. There's some put spread buying that goes through the market. It's pretty clear what people do. So you don't need to engineer it too much. If you see a lot of int open interest on the put side, it's either long a put or part of a spread, generally. One can go into a lot more detail, but I'm, there are others who could do it a lot better than I do. But that's the basic idea. And uh, so even if you know where the open interest is, you can infer what the um, positioning might be. The high tech way to do it is to say, I'm going to look at every trade that goes through the market, look at the bid and the ask before the trade and see if the trade moved, if the trade price was above the mid or below the mid and then back out whether it was a buy or a sell. But that's way beyond the scope of yeah. what most people will want to do. Yeah, or, or have any ability or, or understanding to do. Um, so we are at the point where it's time to ask my final question which is the exact same question for every guest, no matter what the topic, even if it's a non-financial topic, same question, every guest, all right? And uh, you not knowing what it is helps because I like to spring it on people. So uh, <laughs> the question is simply, if you could leave our listeners with a single thought today, what would it be? What would you like to leave them with? Uh, there's a lot more to think about than just the U.S. stock market or even stock markets in general. There are a lot of good reasons to think about real assets, to think about bonds, especially now that yields have widened out, and other strategies as well. So broaden your palette, stick to your strategy, but build it out, broaden it over time. And I think you may be well positioned for what could happen in the next five or 10 years. Excellent. That is perfect. I totally agree with you. And I, that has been a message of mine um, oh, right. In the Ferris report over the past year, I've, I've been trying to get people to do other things. So thank you. I can hey, always say, question. hey, look, it's it's not just me. It's Hari. He's, 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 <laughs> he's. <laughs> I noticed that a lot of people are worried about AI and their, mm. the, what AI is going to do and this and that. But they're forgetting that people have to eat. They have yeah. to get places. They have to do stuff, right? Yep. And right. Uh, yeah. even if you're, whether you're green or not, you need copper, you need infrastructure you need to uh there are all sorts of issues that will present themselves food nationalism and so on mm -hmm. in the commodity markets and the ownership is so low it's, there's got to be stuff to do there and yep. that that's a topic for another another podcast but yeah 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 maybe we'll have you back we can talk more about that but listen hari thanks so much for being here i'm really glad that you came to talk thanks NVIDIA may be America's top performing stock after more than doubling this year alone, but if you're holding NVIDIA or thinking of buying it to get a stake in the $7 trillion AI market, you're going to want to see Mark Chaikin's new AI prediction first. Mark is a regular on many major news outlets from Fox Business to CNBC, and he built the stock indicator Wall Street uses to find winning stocks. His award-winning system flashed by on Tesla before it climbed 335%, Moderna before it climbed 300%, and Riot Blockchain before it climbed 10,090%. It also found NVIDIA at the start of 2023 before its massive bull run. But right now, Mark is stepping forward to warn people to stay away from NVIDIA. My system has indicated that NVIDIA is no longer the best stock to buy to profit from AI, Mark says. In fact, it just flashed by on a totally different AI stock. And today, he'd like to hand you the name and ticker symbol of his number one AI stock to buy right now. For a limited time, you can get this information for free at www.aifrenzyreport.com. Again, that's www.aifrenzyreport.com for a free copy of his new report.
So obviously a very sophisticated guy. You know, people who deal in options like that, they, you know, they know more math about investing than I will ever understand in my life. They've forgotten more math about investing than I'll ever know. But I was impressed um, in writing and in other podcasts that I've seen Hari in with his ability to sort of keep things simple and still offer some value. And I, I hope everyone agrees that he did that. Um, how did you find that conversation? Yeah, I mean, I feel like... <clears throat> Excuse me. I feel like he said a lot, but there's so much more beyond uh, what even what he was talking about, which which was a lot. And so, but I think the the value, the idea of just of hedging in general, right? Like like he said at the at the end, um, you know, we and a lot of people are focused, or me, are focused mostly on on U.S. stocks, right? And the idea that when <laughs> of the coiling of the markets you know, and the rallies being so strong and the sell-offs also being so strong, um, just be ready for that stuff and not be caught off guard by it. Because I think he's totally right. Like we, like you brought up with the, we're coming off this Fed meeting and we're seeing it right, like right away. All of a sudden it seems like st- the indexes are at new all-time highs or, or, or close. And, you know, just a couple of months ago, people were pretty bearish on the markets overall. So, um, yeah. And the point being, that is when you want to be putting on hedges, not when the crisis happens. Although there are things to do at that point, too, which he wrote an entire book about. Right. And I think the point, too, for, um, you know, the longer dated uh, puts, you know, a couple years out, maybe, you know, 15, like five and 10 percent out of the money, because like he said, you if you get that 15% drawdown that you're hedging against, you want to be in the money. So just hearing him tell me about that, really valuable. Hearing him tell me that three to six months out, the massive institutional whales of the world are jacking the pricing up. So be careful there. I thought that was really valuable. And, you know, just telling me that right now is kind of a neat time for people to think about hedging and it's not that difficult to do. Um, I thought that was all really valuable stuff. And, you know, he's just a great guy and a fun guy to talk to overall, I think. So, yeah, good stuff. Well, that's another interview, and that's another episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. We do provide a transcript for every episode. Just go to www.investorhour.com, click on the episode you want, scroll all the way down, click on the word transcript, and enjoy. If you like this episode and know anybody else who might like it, tell them to check it out on their podcast app or at InvestorHour.com, please. And also, do me a favor, subscribe to the show on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And while you're there, help us grow with a rate and a review. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Our handle is at InvestorHour. On Twitter, our handle is at Investor underscore Hour. Have a guest you want us to interview? Drop us a note at feedback at investorhour.com or call our listener feedback line 800-381-2357. Tell us what's on your mind and hear your voice on the show. For my co-host, Corey McLaughlin, until next week, I'm Dan Ferris. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. To access today's notes and receive notice of upcoming episodes, go to investorhour.com and enter your email. Have a question for Dan? Send him an email, feedback at InvestorHour.com. This broadcast is for entertainment purposes only and should not be considered personalized investment advice. Trading stocks and all other financial instruments involves risk. You should not make any investment decision based solely on what you hear. Stansberry Investor Hour is produced by Stansberry Research and is copyrighted by the Stansberry Radio Network. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansberry Research, its parent company, or affiliates. You should not treat any opinion expressed on this program as a specific inducement to make a particular investment or follow a particular strategy, but only as an expression of opinion. Neither Stansberry Research nor its parent company or affiliates warrant the completeness or accuracy of the information expressed on this program, and it should not be relied upon as such. Stansberry Research, its affiliates and subsidiaries are not under any obligation to update or correct any information provided on the program. The statements and opinions expressed on this program are subject to change without notice. No part of the contributor's compensation from Stansberry Research is related to the specific opinions they express. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Stansberry Research does not guarantee any specific outcome or profit. You should be aware of the real risk of loss in following any strategy or investment discussed on this program. 
Strategies or investments discussed may fluctuate in price or value. Investors may get back less than invested. Investments or strategies mentioned on this program may not be suitable for you. This material does not take into account your particular investment objectives, financial situation, or needs, and is not intended as a recommendation that is appropriate for you. You must make an independent decision regarding investments or strategies mentioned on this program. Before acting on information on the program, you should consider whether it is suitable for your particular circumstances and strongly